Hello everyone, welcome back to Scalers YouTube channel. Today we're going to continue the GCP tutorial series and in module 3, we're going to look at storage. So we're going to look into two different things. One would be disks and one would be cloud storage. So before moving on and understanding more about that, make sure to subscribe to Scalers YouTube channel and also hit the bell icon so that you don't miss our upcoming updates and also miss out on the upcoming videos from this series itself. Also, if you want to learn technologies and frameworks from industry leading experts for free, check out the master classes and the link is provided in the description. You can go ahead and learn from that. Now let's look at the topics which I'm going to cover in this particular session and also summarize it a little bit. To start off with, we'll be looking into persistent disks. So in the previous module, we looked into GCE, that is Google Compute Engine. And while we created a virtual machine, there was something attached to it for storage, which is called a persistent disk. That's what I'm gonna talk about first. And I'm gonna show you how to create a persistent disk individually and then attach it manually to the virtual machine. After that, we'll be looking into cloud storage, which is another type of a storage service. And here it is object storage. I'll talk about what object storage is and more about that. So we'll be looking into that. And also I'll show you how to set up a base of static website hosting as well. So this is what we're gonna talk about in this particular session. Now let's get started. What are persistent disks? So persistent disk is any kind of a block storage device. For example, this laptop has a hard drive, uh, an SSD, uh, external SSDs, all of these are basically storage disks or block storage disks. Persistent disks on GCP is also the same. So let's look into that. It's durable and a high performance block storage device. You can connect it to GCE's virtual machines. Now it also provides a flexible and a scalable way to store and access data for virtual machines, allowing users to create, format and mount, even unmount disks according to their workloads. Uh, to put it very simply, uh, they have different types of disk types we'll look at later, but mainly there are SSDs and HDDs. SSDs are obviously faster than uh, hard disk drives, right? Because hard disks uh, take a lot of time to write. And that in that case, it's cheaper, but hard disks are mainly used for archival or backup data right now. Uh, for more uh, in real time use cases, uh, you'll have to use uh, SSDs. So now talking about that, in this case, what they have mentioned here, it's flexible and scalable way to store. Basically means uh, the same persistent disk, you can uh, increase the size up to um, terabytes. It can also be gigabytes. So you can go from gigabytes to terabytes. And also one more benefit here is that you can increase the number of disks. You don't have to increase just one disk scale. For example, one virtual machine needs uh, like let's say two TB but you don't want to just have one single disk. Uh, so you can divide it into two, one TB each and you can create two persistent disks and attach it to the same virtual machine. So it will be like two different uh, storage devices attached to one single computer. It's basically like that, right? Uh, okay, so that's what persistent disks are. There is nothing else to discuss over here. They're automatically replicated within a single zone to protect against data loss and can also be replicated across zones or regions for higher availability. So to put it simply, as soon as you create it uh, in the same zone, it gets replicated. That is so that if this particular disk uh, gets accidentally deleted or there's any data loss, there would be another disk with the same data existing. You can just take a, a backup from it or you can uh, basically create a new disk with that backup data. Uh, yeah, so you can also make, uh, an, uh, there's also an option to replicate it across multiple zones. So if the entire zone is down, you can get the data from another zone's disk. So these are some of the examples and uh, this is what a persistent disk is. Now, moving further, let's look at the different storage options, not just persistent disks. There are different types of storage options in GCP. Let's look into that. First is a zonal persistent disk. Efficient, reliable block storage. It exists in only one single zone. Uh, it cannot be connected to virtual machines across multiple zones. Now, there is a regional persistent disk. You can create a regional block storage, which is available for the entire region. Uh, that region can have three to four different zones, right? We've already saw that. So in this case, when it has multiple zones, uh, you can create a regional persistent disk that is available across multiple zones and you can attach it to virtual machines across those zones. Local SSD. 
high performance transient local block storage uh, so basically again uh, you can connect a local storage to it uh, these are some of the three disk options that compute engine provides the fourth one is cloud storage buckets affordable st object storage this is the second part of this particular tutorial so please wait we'll go ahead with that and then finally file store a high performance file store for google cloud users uh, this is basically a shared file storage for example let's say there's a large data set and there are 100 different servers and all of those servers need that particular data set to run a machine learning algorithm what would be the right thing to do uh, and also the most efficient thing to do would you upload this one single data set into all of these hundred servers or would you have a storage that can connect to all of these hundred servers and it's just one storage it can connect to hundred servers and upload the file just to that particular storage uh, just think and put it in the comment section the answer is that you should do the second option that is upload the data to that one single file store that can connect to 100 or 200 different servers so that the file is stored only once you are paying for the files uh, you will be paying for the file storage right so if you store it across 100 servers you'll have to pay 100x more so in this case you'll just have to pay for it once but you can connect it to 100 servers and all of these servers can fetch the data set from that single point of uh, storage so this is what file store is so these are the storage options that uh, Compute Engine provides and in this case only Compute Engine there are also database services that we'll cover in the next module so don't worry about that now moving further persistent disk types uh, there are mainly four one is standard one is balanced one is performance persistent disks and finally extreme persistent disks let's start from the standard uh, these are the ones which get created when you create a simple uh, virtual machine for practice so suitable for large data processing workloads that primarily use sequential input outputs and it's backed by HDD. So again, it's hard disk, it's not uh, SSD in this case. So uh, I wouldn't suggest or I don't think anybody would suggest to go with a standard persistent disk. If you want, you can do, but the best one would always be balanced persistent disk for a practice or a test environment because it has both performance and also cost consideration so it's in the average or it's in the mid range now alternative to performance persistent disk there is one more right performance persistent disk balance of performance and cost as i told you it gives you good performance for a cheaper cost uh, for most virtual machines except very large ones these disks have uh, same maximum iops as persistent disks uh, these ones ssd persistent disks uh, and lower iops per gb this is also backed by SSD, but it's not completely SSD. So uh, over here, you can see it is balanced. So this is the one which I would suggest to always use with your virtual machine because it's balanced cost and performance and uh, it'll give you a decent uh, input output. It'll give you a decent throughput. It'll give you a decent uh, read write as well. That's what I was coming to say. Now coming to the next one, which is performance persistent disks, right? In this case, it's basically performance oriented. It's a little bit more expensive than the balanced ones, but this provides more throughput. So suitable for enterprise applications and high performance databases that require lower latency and more IOPS than persistent disks, that standard persistent disks provide. Lower latency in the sense you can retrieve data faster than the other disks, which I already mentioned before. Uh, so you can see designed for single digit millisecond latencies. That is, it will only take a couple milliseconds for it to retrieve data for you. The observed latency is application specific. And also you will have to kind of optimize your application in order to, uh, for you to take the maximum benefit out of the single digit millisecond latency, right? You'll have to build your application. That's why they mentioned the observed latency is application specific. Whatever application they used to test uh, it retrieved data in single digit millisecond latencies, right? Now, yeah, the final one is backed by solid state drives, SSD again, right? Now, finally, extreme persistent disks offer consistently high performance for both random access workloads and bulk throughput. There is a load of data coming into uh, the system that is bulk data in batch data, uh, a lot of data, basically in terabytes or petabytes are coming in. So for that, 
extreme persistent discs would be the best go but again this is the most expensive uh, disc type in these four designed for high-end database workloads such as oracle or sap hana allow you to provision the target iops you can select how much throughput you need how much iops you need it's also backed by ssd because ssds are faster than uh, hdds available with a limited number of mission types one more thing you'll have to note here is extreme persistent discs are not available for all the uh, disk uh, sorry all the virtual machine types only a few has it so the most basic virtual machines can't use extreme persistent disk and there is no need for an extreme persistent disk okay so hope this is clear these are the four different types of persistent disks available in gcp now let's start with the next topic which is cloud storage First of all, we'll understand what exactly is cloud storage. Now, cloud storage, again, is the name of Google's storage option itself. But again, what exactly is the term cloud storage, the normal term? So first of all, cloud storage, you would know from Drive, uh, Google Drive, there is OneDrive, there is Dropbox. These are all storage on the cloud. But what these are basically software as a service. Software as a service in the sense, they are providing you a software where you can upload these data let's say let's consider google drive you're uploading this data in google drive so now this data is stored somewhere but you wouldn't know where it is stored uh, you can view the uh, content you can download the content you can delete it if you want so you have all the control over the data you upload but you don't have any control over the uh, tool itself because it's a software as a service Be uh, a software as a service is basically uh, a service which is provided to you over the internet, but it's a software, that's it. So now in this case, in Google Drive, uh, you don't have access to individual objects. You can't uh, share it as a website. You can't host websites in Google Drive. Now, cloud storage, when it comes to GCP, it's a tool which lets you do more than that. Because in this, you can store objects. Like even in Google Drive, you can store all kinds of objects. So now objects are basically an immutable piece of data consisting of a file of any format. It doesn't matter what file format it is. It can be a JPEG, it can be a audio file, it can be a image file, a video file, doesn't matter, it's all binary. If it is binary, it is a object, binary large object, uh, right? So uh, it's called, you can also call it blob. Uh, in Azure, it's called blob storage. So in this case, it's uh, cloud storage in S, uh, sorry, in AWS, it's called S3. They're all the same service, literally. Uh, yes, so you can store all kinds of uh, file formats here. So you store objects in containers called buckets. So why exactly the term bucket? Because buckets don't have layers, right? It's just one single entity. Uh, you can just put stuff inside that. One would be in the bottom, one would be in the top, but doesn't matter, they're all in the same space. Uh, to put it simply, if you know about GitHub, it's like a repository. It has, you can create hierarchical layers, but there is exactly no hierarchy. To go to a particular place, you can use that particular hierarchy. For example, in one bucket, if you throw images and if you throw videos, or let's consider it as two different colored balls, uh, one yellow and one blue, we are throwing it all together. So now they will all get jumbled up. So to just pick up blue balls, it'll be a bit of a task because you'll have to just select those ones and then take it out. But what if before you throw in the balls, you just quickly create a simple partition over there, which is kind of logical in this case, but again, you create a partition over there. One side you write blue, one side you write yellow and just throw the blue balls on the right side, yellow on the left side, so that when you can pick up the blue balls, you can just pick it up from one single side, right? So now same way in this case, Let's say in a, you create a, a cloud storage bucket. In the bucket, you can create two different entities or two different folders. One is images, one is videos. And inside that, you can basically throw in the images files in the images one, videos in the videos one. But they're not exactly folders. They are just pathways. They are just identifiers. So within uh, images, you will have all the images file because you stored it there. So now, whatever the URL is, it'll have slash images slash the file's name. That is the key. Same thing with videos, uh, whatever the URL is, it will be written videos slash the file name. So now it's easier to navigate. That's the only reason we basically make these partitions within buckets. But all the files are just stored in one single entity. That's basically it. Now, all buckets are associated with a project and you can group your projects under an organization. Uh, we'll look at the organization, the structure again. 
in the next uh, uh, slide. Now, each project bucket and object in cloud, Google Cloud is a resource in Google Cloud. Uh, so to put it simply, uh, once you create a bucket and inside that you are uploading 100 objects, each of those objects are considered as a resource within Google Cloud. So that's basically it. it it's not a separate entity, even though it's your object, your, the, your objects are still stored in Google's cloud. So basically they are a resource and a part of your Google Cloud uh, infrastructure. That's it. So now let's look at the storage structure. This is the organization structure. The, at the very top, you can see an organization. And let's just consider their name is Example Incorporated. Now, within the organization, there is a project. And in this case, the project is called the messaging app. So now each of these projects, for example, in our case, uh, in the last session, if you would have seen, or in the last uh, a demo, if you would have seen it, it was written my first project, right? So that's basically the project name, uh, which I'm using. Like you would have a different project, but when you create uh, a GCP account, it automatically creates you a project called my first project. Then you can create more uh, to club resources together. So in this case, in my first project, uh, here they've named it as messaging app. So now within messaging app, there are multiple services. So there is compute engine, BigQuery, billing, monitoring, all of the services that come under uh, GCP and whatever you create within that particular project will come under that particular project. It will come under as a resource under that particular project. So now in this case, there is cloud storage. Now in cloud storage, there is a bucket called photos. In photos, there is an object called puppy.png. So now all of these files and all of these resources are directly a resource of this project. And they're also a direct resource of the entire organization. So now you can have 10 different projects with different resources. So one project, if you upload uh, photos in another project, you create and in that project, you create a bucket and upload videos. So that videos would be a resource of that particular project. And these images would be a resource of yeah, this particular project. So now all of these projects are a resource of the organization. This is basically the structure or the hierarchy which is followed here. Uh, hope this is clear. Now moving further. Now, security features, identity and access management. Uh, you can use IAM to control who has access to the resources in your Google Cloud project. Resources include uh, cloud storage buckets and objects as well as other Google Cloud entities such as compute. So to put it simply, uh, identity and access management. Uh, in this case, you can create users. Uh, for example, you should not share your root credentials. So to not do that, let's say when somebody is asking for permission to use a particular service within the organization's GCP account, you can create a user for them, uh, user account for them, and that user account will have a specific set of permissions. And only those permissions can be uh, done. Like for example, if that particular user has a permission to create a Google Compute Engine virtual missions, they can only create them. If you have not given the permission to delete it, they can't. They can only create them and that's it. They can't delete it. So you can control uh, the identity and you can control the access to the resources they have as well, right? This is basically identity and access management and using this, you can secure your cloud storage. Data encryption, again, by default, you get uh, data encryption in two cases. One is at rest and one is in transit. Uh, you can use your own customer managed encryption keys if you have a key. Uh, yeah, that's one. Third one is authentication. Ensure that anyone who accesses your data has proper credentials. Bucket log, govern how long uh, objects and buckets must, must be retained by specifying a retention policy. A retention policy is basically, uh, it's also available in a Google Drive. For example, let's say there is an object which you deleted. It'll be in trash for like 30 days and after that it'll get permanently deleted. Similarly, in this case, if there is an object in your bucket for uh, let's say uh, two months and you want to delete it after two months, you can set up this policy. It'll automatically delete it after two, two months. So that's basically it. And finally, object versioning. This is an important concept. For example, let's say you up upload an object called 1.png. Now, let's say there is an updated version of 1.png and it's the same image and you want to upload the same file with the same name. So now what you can do is you can, uh, if you don't enable object versioning, when you upload 1.png once again, it will overwrite the previous file. That 
that basically means that you delete the previous file and upload the new one. But when there is object versioning, it will upload the newer version as well, but it will give a version ID for the newer one and another version ID for the older one. And the newer version will be visible. The older version will be available in the bucket. If you click on show versions, then you can see all the versions of the same file. So these are some security features and also other features are Google Cloud Storage. So now moving further, these are important, but actually pretty simple buckets. The main building block or the basic building block of any container in Google Cloud is uh, basically a bucket. A bucket itself is a container. And without a bucket, you can't store objects, right? So this is the basic building block. And everything that you store in cloud storage must be in a bucket. You can create multiple buckets and in one single bucket, you can store any kind of objects you want. Uh, you can use to organize data, control access to your data, but unlike directories and folders, you cannot nest buckets. So that is, for example, in Linux, you have a root folder and under the root folder, you have subdirectories. Under the subdirectories, you have, again, more subdirectories and it keeps going on, right? But in this case, that's not possible. I already gave you an example and explained that it's a bucket to store. You will have to throw everything in together, but you can label them so that it's easier to pick up. That's basically it. Now, there is no limit to the number of buckets you can have in a project or location. That is, you can have uh, 100 or even uh, 200 or thousands of buckets in one single uh, project. But there is limits to the rate you can create or delete buckets. That is, at at one particular time, you can only create 50 or something like that. So if you want to increase your quota, you'll have to basically contact uh, GCP support and they will help you with that. Now, when you create a bucket, you'll have to give it a globally unique name. So bucket names are uh, basically the same throughout GCP. That basically means some guy in US who has a GCP account can create a bucket name with hello, but you can't create another bucket with the same name as hello in the Indian region because bucket names are globally unique because they will be incorporated with the URL and URLs should be unique for every single bucket. And to make sure that is unique, that's why you will have to provide a globally unique name, right? It is geographically uh, like basically global. And even though you select one particular location for where the data should be stored, it doesn't matter the name should still be globally unique. Okay, so this is basically buckets. Now, about bucket names, we have to follow certain requirements. One is uh, it can only contain lowercase letters, numeric characters, dashes, underscores, and dots. Uh, spaces are not allowed. Names containing dots require verification. That basically means names requiring dots. For example, if you have a website name, uh, let's say example.com, again, it will have to get verified that you have this particular domain with you, something like that. Right now, bucket names must start and end with a number or a letter. You can't use a special character or you can't use anything else apart from number or letter to start with and also end with. Now, bucket names must contain three to 63 characters, minimum is three, maximum is 63. Uh, names containing dots can contain up to 222 characters. That is, uh, if there are so many dots, then Including the dots, there can be 222 characters. But each dot separated component can be no longer than 63 characters. That basically means there can be uh, 222 dots. Uh, sorry, not 222. There can be a name which has A and then 220 dots and then B. So this is still a valid name. But uh, the letters and numbers apart from the dots can only be 63. That's the maximum number. Bucket names cannot be represented as an IP address. This is very important. Uh, instead of providing a domain name, you can't give an IP address in this case because it's invalid. Bucket names cannot begin with the uh, G-O-O-G prefix because it's GCP and this G-O-O-G prefix is used in a lot of Google's website itself. So you can't use that. It cannot contain Google or different misspellings of Google itself. Uh, so these are the basic bucket name requirements. So make sure you follow and adhere to these rules while you create a bucket name and it'll be easier for you. You can just create a very specific uh, name which you know and it won't be global. Uh, so it will be available. Okay, so now the last concept before we move on to the cloud storage demo, 
which is storage classes. Storage classes are again a piece of metadata that is used by every object. So what exactly is metadata? Uh, let's say in your local system you have an image. Just click on the image, right click and go to details and check all the information. So that information is metadata. The size of that file, the type of that file, uh, basically uh, every single information which doesn't exactly uh, is the file itself, which supports the file to give it a meaning to the computer. Those are all metadata. So in this case, storage classes are also metadata. Uh, for example, the URL to the file is a metadata. Sto storage classes basically gives you an idea about the object's availability and uh, also the pricing model. For example, if your object is constantly downloaded or used by your users, then it should use a storage class that lets it do that. That is, it should be frequently accessible, right? Uh, but again, if your company has some historical data, let's say from 10 years back and you want to store it and you're not going to use it at all, it's just historical data, so it, you want it to be there, but you will rarely use it. So that can be stored in backup or archival. So there are storage classes for that as well. So now it depends on what kind of an av availability you want for the object. You want it to be frequently accessible or you want to back it up or you want to archive it. So it totally depends on that. And also uh, frequently accessible uh, storage classes will cost a little bit more than the ones which you archive or back up because that data will be just stored there. You're not retrieving or downloading. So there won't be a lot of cost involved in this case, right? So you can change the storage classes of an existing object either by rewriting the object or by using object lifecycle management. There's one more concept called lifecycle management. Let's say an object is currently in the frequent class. Now you can transform it to the infrequent class. Let's say uh, whenever a new object gets created, it's in frequent use for one month. And after two months, that is after three months, it gets infrequently accessed. So the first three months, you can give frequent access that particular class. And then after three months, you can convert it into an infrequent class. And to set this up automatically, you can use a lifecycle management policy. You can enable auto class feature on a bucket to let cloud storage manage storage class transitions for you automatically. So uh, if you just let it be auto class, Google itself will decide what kind of a file it is. And for example, if the file is not used for six months, they'll automatically push it to an infrequently accessed storage class. Uh, yeah, so next one is when you create a bucket, you can specify a default storage class for the bucket. When you add objects to the bucket, these objects will inherit the storage class and keep them as their own metadata. If you don't specify a default storage class when you create a bucket, the bucket default storage class is set to standard storage. So standard storage is the normal one where you frequently access data or normally access data. And final point here is changing the default storage of a bucket does not affect any of the objects that already exist in the bucket. For example, let's say uh, you keep it as standard storage and upload uh, 10 objects that will have standard storage, but then you want to make the incoming uh, files as archival. So if you want to use that particular storage class, you can use it. Now let's look at the four different storage classes available in this particular cloud storage. So first there is a standard storage, there is a near line storage, there is a cold line storage, and there is a archive storage. Now first let's look at standard. Standard is the most common and the default storage class in Google Cloud. Minimum storage duration, none. You can store it for one day, you can store it for uh, one year, you can store it for 10 years. Minimum storage duration, doesn't matter. You can upload it now and delete it in two minutes as well. Retrieval fees, none. Uh, but typical monthly availability is 99.99% in multiple regions and 99.99% in regions. So it's greater than 99.99% in multi-regions and dual regions. So what exactly is this? 99.99% why exactly is this? Uh, they give you a guarantee that this object will be available for 99.99% of the time. Very rarely, that is 0.001% is the uh, failure. That is, it can fail for that much uh, time. So that is basically the agreement they say to you. So you there is something called SLA, Service Legal Agreement, which these cloud storage 
uh, or these cloud companies like AWS, Azure, GCP all provide. And they basically give you an idea of how durable and how uh, available that particular storage option is. Next, nearline storage, minimum storage should be at least 30 days. And uh, nearline storage is mostly used for uh, infrequent access. It's not exactly backup data, but it's just similar data to standard storage, but it's not used very often. That is, uh, standard storage data is used, let's say, every single hour, but nearline might be used every single, uh, like once in three days or bi-weekly, something like that, nearline storage. Third one is cold line storage. Minimum storage is nine, uh, 90 days. Uh, so cold line storage from the name itself, it's pretty evident because you would know there is something called cold storage. Cold storage directly means backup data. So this particular uh, stand storage class is used for, it's used for backup data. That's basically it. And then finally archive, minimum storage duration is 365 days. This is where you throw your history uh, data and forget about it. If you are not going to use it, it will be there for sure. But retrieval fees is there and retrieval time increases from one storage to another. Standard storage has the fastest retrieval speeds, then near line, then cold line and finally archive. These are the four storage classes guys. So now that's basically uh, uh, all the theory for cloud storage. In the next session, that's basically all the theory for cloud storage. Now let's proceed with the cloud storage demo. Uh, so let me explain before starting off. First, we'll be creating a cloud storage bucket, which is pretty simple and uploading objects. It's also one single task. Uh, it's not really complex. And then I'll also show you around in that particular console, what are the different options available in cloud storage buckets. And finally, I'll show you how to set up the base for static website hosting. Right, so these are the things we'll be doing. Now let's get started with the demo. So let's start by creating a persistent disk, right? Okay, I've already opened the Compute Engines console over here and under storage, there is an option called disks. Click on that and you will be under the page where you can create persistent disks. So now I don't have a virtual machine right now. Uh, we'll create that later. Let's start with the disk itself. Okay, so now let's start by creating the disk. We already discussed so much about it. Now, while creating it, I'll explain certain things. Uh, so I'm going to name it as tutorial disk one. Description uh, persistent disk for practice. So uh, description is not a mandatory thing. You don't see an asterisk over here. So you don't have to add it. I'm just adding it just like that. Now location, there are two options, single zone, uh, regional. As you told you, single zone is just for that particular zone. Regional will have multiple. You can have in one zone and there can be a replica zone for it as well. This is the primary zone. You can see it over here, isolated within the region. The zone determines the computing resources are available and where your data is stored and used. So there are two different zones in this case, but I'm gonna go with a single zone. I just want my disk to be created in one single zone. And uh, there are four options, 1C, 1A, 1F, and 1B. Uh, for example, let's take 1B this time. Uh, it doesn't basically um, do a lot of, uh, make a lot of change here, make a lot of difference, right? Okay, that's done. Next is source type. Is it a blank disk or an image or a snapshot or an archive snapshot? Blank disk is a normal persistent disk, which doesn't have any data. It's just a blank drive. Second, an image. So image is basically a copy of a virtual machine. In the last session, I showed you how to do that. So you can go ahead and check if you are not clear about it. Uh, in this case, image is basically a copy of that virtual machine. So that would also be stored. And uh, to store that image, a snapshot would be used. So now, is it a image type of a disk? Or if you want to store a, a snapshot, a snapshot is basically a backup file. And an archive snapshot is basically a backup file of the archived data. So these are the four different types they're asking. I'm just going to go with blank disk. So now, as I told you, uh, for a simple uh, virtual machine, which you just use for practice, I would suggest to go with balanced persistent disk every single time because there's extreme, there's SSD and standard. Uh, extreme, you know what extreme is. SSD is basically the uh, third option. And standard is, standard is backed by hard drive. 
So I wouldn't suggest this. Always go with balanced. It gives you a little bit of performance for a cheaper cost. Now size, you can choose anything between 10 GB to 65,536 GB. Uh, that's almost yeah. basically 65 uh, up to 65 terabytes. I'm just going to go with 10 GB, the most uh, cheapest one. Or right now, anyway, it'll go under the free to real credit. So you can still go with 100 GB and you don't get charged for allocating 100 GB. You get charged for storing 100 GB. For example, let's say you allocated 100 GB. It is dynamically allocated. So 100 GB is allocated to you, but it's not allocated in the hard hardware itself. For example, let's say you have stored 5 GB of data. You just pay for that 5 GB of storage, not the remaining empty 95 GB because it's dynamically allocated. Only that 5 GB is allocated right now. Later, if you upload 20 GB worth of uh, files, now it will be 25 GB. So you just pay for the 25 GB. Uh, again, as dynamically allocates, as you upload, the storage increases like that. Storage spaces get uh, added dynamically, right? So that's done, uh, enable snapshot schedule. So again, if you are uh, having an application which needs a constant backup, go ahead with a snapshot schedule. It's recommended uh, every single uh, day, like you can basically choose a particular time and or you can create your own uh, schedule uh, over here, create a schedule, right? Yeah, so this can be done. Uh, if you want a snapshot schedule, you can choose. I don't need one because again, it's a practice disk encryption i'm just going to go with google managed encryption key if you have a customer managed that is if you have your own encryption key which you created you can use this if you have your own customer uh, basically your own encryption key which is outside of uh, google cloud key then you can go ahead with that as well so and label you can provide a label over here if you want you can provide it like name and uh, vm something like this, but I don't need that. Yeah, so now you can clearly read here, you're creating an unformatted disk. It's not formatted. You can't directly store files in it. You will have to format it before you start storing or creating files within the uh, disk, right? Format the disk after you attach it to your VM. So there is an option here called format and mounting a zonal persistent disk. Uh, we'll come to that part later, right? So now all the information is provided, right? now created. Now you can clearly see here successfully created disk. So the disk has been created. Uh, you can see the zone is US Central 1B, uh, balanced persistent disk. Uh, there is no snapshot sh uh, schedule. You can create an instance and directly attach it to this particular uh, disk, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you separately uh, because I want to uh, show one particular thing which is very important here. So you can clearly see, just note this down or let's just remember this, US Central 1B is the zone which this particular disk has been created in. Now, let me go ahead and create two different instances. One I'm gonna create in the same zone, one I'm gonna create in a different zone, okay? So now, create instance. And over here, I'm gonna provide it as uh, instance one, um zone a right and it's in zone a let it be in zone a i'm just going to leave everything default just changing this to e2 micro uh, enable display device hello access yeah let rest everything let it be i'm creating it this is in a different zone remember that now i'm going to create one more while this is getting created this I'm going to name as instance one, uh, zone B, because this one is zone B. So I'm going to create it as zone B. Uh, this one is going to be in zone B. This is also Iowa, right? US Central 1B, US Central 1B, yes. Mission type is going to be e2.micro and then enable display device because I am currently capturing my laptop screen. So I need to enable this, otherwise you can't see that. Okay, so that is done. So I'm just letting everything be, uh, the default options, I'm not going to change anything. So creating it. Now, two instances are getting created. One I've already created. So now what I want to show is, this is a different zone, right? This is in 
this is this is a different zone right this is in zone a so now let's try connecting it over here you can see uh let me go inside this and over here you will have an option for disks over here you can see currently one disk has been attached now and where is this device let's check where this device is created in uh, yeah so you can see it is in us central 1a now coming back here let's try to connect it to an instance so i'm going to go inside operations okay so now i'm going to go attach this tutorial disk these two are disks which got created uh, when we created those two instances you can see this one was created for the uh, zone a instance this one for zone b instance now we are still in the zone a instance so let me go over here edit this and uh, go to disks add new disk over here uh, sorry attach existing disk because we already created it but over here you can see no attachable disks in us central 1a even though it is in the same region the disk is in the same region you can't connect it to the virtual machine which is also in the same region because they are in two different zones so this is what I wanted to convey. So whenever you are creating a disk and you want to attach it to an instance, make sure you are creating that disk in the same zone as your virtual machine. Okay, so that is done. Uh, let me delete this instance. Now going back to virtual machines. Now there is one virtual machine which we created, which we can use, which is zone B. Now again, I'm going to zone B edit this go ahead and add a new disk sorry attach existing disk click on it and you will see the disk you have created balanced persistent disk 10 gb and it's not attached to any other instance and also one disk can't be attached to multiple instances it can be only attached to one instance if you want to attach to multiple instances that's called a file store you'll have to go ahead and create a file store it's not the same service now tutorial disk one read and write keep disk uh, when deleting instance i also want to delete the disk if you want to do that you can click on this if you want to keep the disk that is when you delete the instance the disk will still be available it won't get deleted right this is one option i'm going to go with delete disk when i delete the instance i want the disk also to be deleted with it which is a much more efficient and easier way uh, i'm not going to go with a custom device name so that you can see our previous instance got deleted I'm just going to go with this and save. Now we have added the disk. Let's just save this quickly. This instance now will be getting updated. Okay. Yeah. So now the previous instance got deleted and this instance is running. Now let's try to open it in a new browser window. So now we have logged into the instance and uh, yeah. So there's this command called lsblk which shows all the uh, disks that are connected to the instance. And when I type LSVLK over here, you can see this is the root disk because it's mounted to the root. And there's one more for boot purposes. Uh, it's in boot slash EFI, right? So this is in boot, but there's one more disk which has 10 GB of storage, like the one which we just created. And it doesn't have any boot that it's not copied. Uh, sorry, it's not mounted or booted. Uh, to this particular uh, instance. So now I just wanted to show you guys one more thing in real time. For example, if we go back to edit and if we remove it and then come back and do an LSPLK, let's see what happens. I'm going to edit. And I'm removing the disk and I'm saving it. Okay, so the disk has been removed, guys. Now let's go back over here and let's do. And now you can see that disk is not visible anymore because we removed it. So now we know that it is the same disk which I added it over. Now let me just add this and then let's start with uh, formatting the disk and mounting it to the disk. 
uh, yeah, attach existing the same format. I'm just gonna just change this and save it. So now the disk has been attached again. Now let's go back and type the same command, lsdsk. And now you can see it's attached. And if you wanna see more information, there's another command df, which gives you a little bit more information about uh, all your file systems. Like for example, there is a SDA1, uh, there is a SDA15, but you can't see SDB because this just shows uh, the file systems which are currently available and this one is not available right now because it's not booted, right? So now let's boot it. Let's clear all this. Now to boot, I already have stored this here. So now our file name is SDB. So you can just open this particular document and over here, you can just type SDB, click here. So now let me just quickly explain this. Uh, sudo is for root permissions. Uh, mkfs.ext4. So this is basically make file system. ext4 is a type of a file system. It's a type of a Linux file system, which is uh, used in a lot of Linux systems. And then, yeah, so they are giving all the information about uh, the table itself and the initial uh, data, right? Once that is given, and they are saying this particular device should be formatted in ext4 format. Uh, that's basically it. You can see here there are other flags. One is to maximize this performance, use the recommended formatting options using minus E flag. So this is not necessary. It's not a mandatory thing. You can just uh, create the file system without this, but they're saying it can uh, maximize disk for performance. So let it be. One more is reserve space for the root volume on the secondary disk. So specify minus M and zero to use all of the available disk space, right? Cool. So now let it be. Now we copied that, paste it, and hit enter. And now you can see a file system has been created, guys. You can see discarding device blocks done, creating file system has been done, uh, allocating group tables, writing in note tables, creating journal, uh, everything is done. So now the file system is ready. So, guys, now the formatting is done. We've converted, uh, we've made the unformatted disk into a formatted disk. So the next thing is to basically mount it. And to mount it, you would need a directory. And over here, you can see they are creating a directory in this location. It doesn't have to be this location. It can be any location. So for that, uh, you can see here, I've created, uh, there's a directory which I've created. Let me remove this. I don't need this. Let me create one more called disk. Um, mount I'll just make it disk mnt created so we're going to use this as our mount point so let me go to this mnt sorry over here let me do a pwd and then copy the location over here yes we've got the location now let's mount it let me come out of this sudo mount and again every time you mount you would need super user permissions so make sure you use sudo in front of it so sudo mount then you'll have to put the device name and over here they have given other options you can see minus o uh, discard slash default so you can use this so again it's not a necessary thing you can directly do it and here it's slash dev slash stb and then this particular location right hit enter it's mounted successfully now if we do an lsblk it should show a mount point and you can see there is a mount point over here right now the last time when we checked there was no mount point but now there is because we have successfully mounted it but even now you can't still uh, so you can see you can't still uh, upload data into it or create stuff into it. So to do that, first of all, you will have to change permissions because right now you wouldn't have permissions to write into it. So now again, this is a different one. Now we just need this sudo, sudo chmod and then a plus w. Again, you don't have to write a plus w. You can also write uh, six double four. 
uh, that will also work. It's just changing uh, the read, write, and execute permissions. So you can do that as well. Uh, next, we'll have to provide the mount point. In our case, it is slash home, slash my name, and then the location, which is disk MND, right? Done, now let's do an LS. And now you can see the permissions have been changed and now it has a differentiation. A regular directory and this particular directory has a differentiation that in this case it's given as in a green color. A regular directory is just in shown in the blue color, right? So what exactly this, this means? It basically means now you can start writing and it will not be stored in the uh, regular storage. Now it will be stored in the file storage of this particular uh, disk. Now to prove that again, let's do one thing. Let's get into this. Over here, you can see there are two files which I already created. Uh, let me delete this. Okay, so now it's deleted. Now only lost and found is there. Let me clear this. Okay, so now we are in the directory which is mounted to the disk we created. Let's quickly create two files uh, touch hello.txt and uh, 2.py. Now there are two files created, guys, and it is stored in the disk. So now what we are going to do is we want to basically uh, again unmount this and once we unmount let's see it the same again there are two files available let's come back and sudo unmount dev slash stb now you can see it's unmounted how can you see that because it's not in the same color right now Let's again go into this. The files are not there because it's not mounted. Now it's just a normal directory. Let me create one more file over here. Okay, one dot txt is created. Let's come back. Let's mount it again. Go to mount. Slash sdb slash home slash name and then this demand now you can see it's again available it's the disk now uh, if i enter the disk and do an ls now you can see there are only two files so where did this file go this file is stored in the root uh, storage now if I unmount from this particular directory then this file will be available and it will be shown so we've successfully completed it guys basically we've uh, created the file uh, we created the disk and once we created the disk we uh, attached it we formatted it we mounted it and also I showed you how to create files within that and how to unmount it as well so this is basically it then you can go ahead and clean up your uh, system now i don't have to delete my disk itself uh, because do you remember i made this one single thing which when i created the disk uh, over here yeah so when i attached the disk i wrote delete disk when deleting the instance it basically means i just have to delete this instance all my disks including the root disk this disk also will get deleted so the cleaning of this has been made much simpler so that's basically it for persistent disks uh, let me delete this so make sure you guys also delete it once it's done because again if it is uh, still there it like can cost you uh, money because currently under the free trail it's fine but if you don't keep it as a particular um, habit otherwise you won't delete it and it will be running and that will cost you a lot of money so now you can see both of these disks are getting deleted because we are deleting the instance this makes it much simpler so you guys also can do this so now this is done uh, this will also get closed because the instance is also getting deleted 
Okay. So now let's go back to the slides. Now let's begin with the first part of this demo, which is creating a cloud storage packet. Uh, this is the most simplest part. Actually, it just takes uh, like, what, 10 seconds to create this. If you know how exactly to create this, it won't take a lot of time. And I've already opened cloud storage. You can search for cloud storage over here, click on it. And the first option is buckets. And in buckets, you will already see some uh, available. Don't panic. It's created by uh, Google themselves. You can clearly see that over here. Because you can see the name of this. This is also the name they've provided for the project which I've created, right? For this C ID. Right. Okay, so this is done. Now let's create a new one. Clicking on create. And again, bucket name, as I told you, should be unique. You can create a bucket name like example.com or if you have a website uh, by yourself or like something name.com. If you have a website, you can provide this. And a bucket name can only use dots to form a valid domain name. If you haven't verified that you are authorized to use this domain, you will have to do so to create this bucket. That is, you will have to have a verified domain that it that domain's name should be yours. You can't simply use, for example, google.com. This won't let you, uh, or you can't use um, microsoft.com. You can use that because you don't own these and you don't have any way to basically provide this particular information that you can't prove that you own microsoft.com, right? If you own your own website's name, then you can provide it. If not, just give a unique name to it. For example, I'm just going to create here a GCP tutorial bucket, right? This is the name I'm providing. I'm pretty sure it's unique. And then over here, there are more options. Continue. Next. Location type, do you want it multi-region, dual region, or region specific? So this is the lowest region, uh, sorry, this is the lowest latency because it's within a single region. This is across two different regions, so it provides low latency. And this is multi-region, uh, highest availability across largest area. So basically this is provided across multiple regions. That is not just one region, uh, within one single region, there are multiple availability zones, right? There are zones. So it's not within one region. This is across multiple regions altogether. So you select multiple regions. For example, in this case, this bucket's data will get replicated across multiple regions in the United States. Next option is dual region. You can choose two regions. One could be Americas. One could be, for example, uh, or you can change the continent to Asia Pacific. And then one you can choose this, and one you can choose that, or one you can choose this, and one you can choose that. Yeah, so within that particular region, you can select two different availability zones, and the data of it will get replicated or will be available in these two different uh, regions, right? Okay, so now finally, there is one more, which is region specific. It's only in one region. Uh, so you can go with any of this. I'm just going to go with uh, this anyway, I'm going to delete it later. But again, this will this is more expensive. You can see it over here. The costs, dual region is cheaper, and you can see the costs over here. And finally, region is the cheapest, right? I'm just going to go with multi-region for now. Continue. Choose a storage class. Again, if you go to auto class, it will automatically determine what class it is. If you go with set a default class, it'll give you the exact price. If you're on near line, it's cheaper. You can see how much cheaper it is. If you're on whole line, it is even cheaper, 0 0.007 per GB per month. Archival data is also even, archival data is even more cheaper from 007, it goes to 0024. But I'm gonna go with standard because it's, uh, it, there is no, uh, limit for the storage uh, days. So I can upload information right now and delete it again. So it doesn't matter. Continue control. How do you want to access it? Do you want uniform control or fine grained access? I'm just going to leave it like this. Now choose how do you want to protect data? None or object versioning. And if you want retention policy, you can add that as well. I'm going to add object versioning max number of versions per object. I want three versions. That is, let's say I'm uploading one object and then I'm uploading the same object again, it'll create a newer version for me. 
if that option was one, the next time when you upload the same file again, the oldest version will get deleted and the uh, newest file will become the latest version and the file which was the latest version before that will become the older version. But if I'm given three, now there will be the latest file, there will be three more versions, uh, like three more versions can be added. That's what is possible. Now this is all provided, now let's create. Now enforce public access prevention on this bucket. Uh, so if you're going to static website host, then it should be publicly accessible because your website won't be available. You can change it now or later, it doesn't matter. You can enforce it right now and remove the access later as well. Uh, let it be enforced, I'll show you guys how to change it later. Uh, so this is one option, you can just directly not pub let public access over here or enforce it. Let me enforce it and confirm it. Okay, now we've created a bucket, that's basically it. Now let's upload some files. Uh, I'm just gonna upload this audio file over here. Now I've enabled versioning, you guys know that. And over here, you can see, right now there is no version history for this. Now, let me upload the exact same object again. Now they're op uh, asking uh, two things, overwrite object or exclude object from this upload apply the same action to all remaining object conflicts. Uh, I can exclude objects from this upload, so continue uploading. Now it's excluded, but what do you wanna do is I want to overwrite. Okay, so now I've overridden it. Now you can see this file has uploaded, but it overwrote the previous file, but even then I can go ahead and check the previous version of the object. Over here you can see, this is the live, job, live object, that basically means the latest object, but there is a previous version which I can restore as well, or delete it if I don't need it. So that's basically it. So for example, I can select this and delete the older version as well, if I want to. Live object is the file which is currently available, right? And then if you want to make this uh, public, you can make it public, this is the metadata over here, right? You can preview the object over here. You can see there is an audio. Uh, yeah. So this buckets, now you know how to upload objects as well. Now you can upload an entire folder over here if you want to. You can create a folder here if you want to, for example, you can create audio files. Now, for example, just check this image. Uh, check this over here. You can see the URL, uh, the bucket's name and the file name over here, bucket's name and the file name. But over here in this folder, if I upload the same file again, now it's not exactly overriding because it's in a different path name. Now if I click on this, now you see the path, scalar gcp tutorial bucket slash audio slash file name. So this is basically how you can utilize these folders and they're very helpful and you can segregate these uh, file types. Basically, that's it. Okay, so now this is done. Next, let's look into static website hosting. That will be the last part of this demo. In static website hosting, first of all, we would need two things. One is basically a web page and then public access. So now let's start with the first thing, which is let's provide this particular bucket public access because these files are not public. You can clearly see it here. Public access, it's not public. Not public means the buckets policy controls all objects uniformly and no permissions have been granted to all users or all authenticated users. All users are basically anybody from the internet, all authenticated users or users within the account itself who have the permission to view it, right? So I'm just gonna go back. Okay, now when you click on the bucket name, you can see there is an option called permissions. Click on that and over here you can see this bucket is not publicly accessible. So now uh, principles restricted from bucket access are these. So to allow this particular principle, you will have to remove public access prevention. So click on remove and click on confirm. So that is done. So now it's still not public, but public access prevention has been deleted. Now, once you've removed the public access prevention option, go back over here and click this. Uh, and here you can see there is a option called edit website configuration. Now click on edit website configuration and add 
index.html over here. And uh, let's say you can provide for not for uh, page.html or error.html. Save. Yeah, so now we've edited the website's configuration. So this basically means that uh, this particular website or this particular bucket can be used as a uh, static website hosting bucket itself, but it's still not public. You will have to make it public until and unless it becomes public, you still can't view these files, even though you have added. So now edit access, we've prevented this. Now you can basically uh, allow all users. Let's see if all users is not allowed. Selecting this. So now again, go back to permissions. And over here, you can see the bucket is not publicly accessible. If you know uh, objects should never be exposed on the public internet, you should also prevent public access to this bucket. But no, I want public access. Uh, that's exactly why I need this. This is inherited permissions. It's permissions with directly received. No object level one switch to fine grain. You can go to fine grain, but right now, uh, let access control be the same, but we'll have to make this public. So click on add principle, and then the role which you will have to select is storage object viewer. And once you selected that, You can provide all users over here and you can see it is allowed now. All users is not blocked anymore. All users is allowed now. And now hit save and click on allow public access. Now this will uh, update the policy which is written. That policy will let us overthrow the uh, pu not publicly accessible part. Now you can clearly see it's written, it's public to internet. Now, the only thing you'll have to do next is, uh, this bucket should be given uh, a name. So for, for example, I've given this name, but you would have to provide this bucket a name of, for example, your own website's configuration name. Or if you don't have a website configuration name, then you will have to go ahead and there is something called the load balancer. You will have to set up the load balancer and the load balancers receiving end would be this particular bucket. This particular bucket currently does not have uh, the uh, index.html file and error.html file. So we can basically uh, upload it over here. We can create two files, index and uh, error, and upload it over here, and that will basically it. For example, let me click, uh, quickly create two files, hello world, uh, and I'm gonna save this as index.html. And I'm on one more file, error, error. And I'm gonna save this as error.html file. Because do you remember, this is what the names we have provided in that website configuration. So your main page should be whatever name you've given over there. If it's index.html, then it should be index.html. If it's not, it should be another name. Same with error.html. So now, yeah, that is fine. Let me close this. Now upload files. Desktop, I'm uploading both of these files. Both the files are uploaded and you can check this. You can see error, error, error and hello world. So these are the two files which I've uh, given. So now if you try to access this particular bucket through a URL, or if you try to access this bucket through, for example, this is not the URL, this will open the console itself. So this doesn't matter. Uh, you need a public URL for this, and without that URL, you won't be able to see index.html or error.html by itself. Okay, so now one more thing I just wanted to show you guys is this rule. Lifecycle rule, uh, you can create a rule over here. You can change the object's lifecycle. That is from one, uh, for example, if the object is there for 30 days, then you want to transition uh, it to another storage class. You can do that using another uh, policy. In this case, for example, let's say you have a file for 30 days 
After 30 days, you want to delete it off permanently. Then you can set it up in lifecycle rule. Then you can add that rule over here. Okay, so that is done. Now coming back to this part. Now we uploaded the files. So now to make the static website hosting possible, you will have to create a load balancer. But this is basically the base for setting up a static website hosting page. We have uploaded the HTML files. We have set up the website configuration over here. We've also uh, made it public access. So these files are publicly accessible now. Over here, this is the uh, website configuration. These are the file names. You have provided this. And if you want to learn more about it, you can just click here. For example, if this particular bucket is connected to, let's say a website called example.com, then when you slash, then when you search for example.com, uh, it should fetch the index.html file. Then if you make a mistake, for example, example.com slash uh, hello, then there is nothing called hello in the bucket. If there is nothing called hello or hello uh, txt or some file related to that, then it will throw the error.html file. You will be able to see the error web page over there. So this is basically it. So now this should be connected to the load balancer and to connect to the load balancer, you will have to create one. And once you've created it, you can set it up. So it can be an HTTP, uh, HTTP, it can be an HTTPS or it can be just a TCP where it can be just uh, HTTP. Uh, this allows both. So you can start configuration over here uh, from internet to my VMs or serverless services. And uh, yeah, so this is basically for your virtual machines. This is not for your, uh, what is this, uh, cloud storage buckets, right? So then there is TCP from internet to my VMs. And then finally UDP, same thing. So now, uh, again, I'm not covering load balancers in this. So please don't expect it. But again, this is just an example. You can go with this and continue. And then the only thing which will become different is the source. In this case, the source would be your uh, bucket. You can check out the documentation for static website hosting in Google's documentation itself. But again, this is the base. Once you set up the base, then go ahead and check how to set up load balancers. But these are the basics. These are more than enough to getting started with GCP. So we looked into Google Compute Engine where we created virtual machines. Then I showed you about persistent disks. And now we looked into Google's cloud storage buckets. So these are some of the important concepts and integral concepts. And in the next session, we'll be looking into uh, database services. And in the final session, we'll be looking into VPC, which is one of the most important thing because without VPC, you can't do anything else, which is a networking tool. So these are the things we'll be seeing. But right now, hopefully this part is clear how to set up cloud storage in this case. And here you provide a front end name and you'll provide a front end IP, back end configuration, back end services. If you have a back end bucket, uh, for example, we have this bucket selected. So this is where you provide all this information. And then using this, you can set up your own static website, right? So you can see it has taken it. Now, the only part we miss is the print and configuration. We do not have anything to reflect on the web page. Uh, that's exactly what we are missing. So that you'll have to go ahead and look into furthermore. Because load balancing, even though it's one of those concepts which are important, uh, it's still not the most integral one. That's why we are only covering all the integral ones, right? So we have set up uh, a bucket, we uploaded objects and also set up the base for static hosting. Hope everything is clear. That's basically it for today's session. In the next session, as I told you, we'll be looking into database services, especially Cloud SQL. Thank you. Meet you in the next one.